Most of us sit at our sewing machines for pleasure. Now try and imagine sewing because your life depended on it. Today's guest, Lucy Adlington, is the author of The Dressmakers of Auschwitz. It's a chronicle of the women who use their sewing skills to survive the Holocaust, stitching beautiful clothes at a most extraordinary fashion workshop created within one of the most notorious World War II death camps. It's both powerful and heartbreaking. So grab your sewing and a cup of tea, and here's my interview with Lucy Adlington. Thank you, Lucy, for being on the podcast. Where in the world are you coming to us from? Well, hello there. I'm actually based in the north of England. I live in a county called Yorkshire, which is a grand place to live, and I live on a farm. Are you originally from Yorkshire? I'm not. I'm from a county in England called Derbyshire, which is very country, very rural, very beautiful. It's the place that Lizzie Bennett wants to visit. I was going to say. Yes. Pembroke, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. home county. And uh, while I'm mentioning Darcy, I do have some gorgeous, gorgeous Regency clothes in my collection. So you went to university and studied medieval history. Was textiles part of your makeup at that point? Funnily enough, I, I think it's my, my undergraduate degree was, was doing English. So that was very much stories, isn't it? Didn't have a lot of context, but it was as an undergraduate that I became interested in World War II history and fragments of history, the way that you might have a text, you know, that gives you a, a, a long account of something, whether it's fictional or otherwise. But I was really interested in the way you can have little fragments of things and, and build a story from that. But yes, when I I came to York University for my MA and that incorporated history, literature and archaeology, a massive brain explosion that you could link all those together. And although there aren't many textiles surviving from the Middle Ages, there are enough that you can find out fascinating things about people's lives. And since then, I've amassed a very interesting, a very unusual collection of antique and vintage garments. Nothing from that far back. (laughs) I think the earliest is, is for me is some 17th century embroidery, which I think is pretty special. And one thing that amuses me about it is that it's unfinished. It's one of those projects that you get really ambitious and you say, I'm going to embroider an entire bed hanging. And they haven't completed it. We all know that feeling. You map it out. I remember Kathy Hay starting off with the peacock dress and realized it was going to take her 80 years to do all the embroidery. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And it, it's so, it's quite sweet to see though. I love the way, I mean, particularly textiles for me, clothing, I'm a clothes historian. I love the way that we get that sense of connection because say for this 17th century uh, embroidery, it is, it is originally for, for bed hangings, but then it was, it was going to be made into a jacket because they obviously thought, God, there's too much to do for a bed hanging. But the design is traced out on the fabric first. And that's exactly how we might approach an embroidery project now to have the design inked out. So I think it's really special not to see the people, people in the past as other, you know, they're us, they could be us, different time, different place. That's what I'm finding too. I I find the minute that you find the textile, you find the gateway into a person's life. Like you can see where seams have been taken out or they've been taken in or lengthened or shortened marks on them people have spilt their dinner on their lap or they've put their heel through their hair or they've sweated on them I I love all of that I've got maternity clothes from the 19th century that have milk stains on you know from that very everyday ordinary thing of of baby feeding so when did you start into textiles was that something that you brought into your degree or did that come after it did come after because one thing that I do love about history is sharing the stories. So it's nice to have stories, but I love the fact that you can reach people in different ways. So I actually set up a historical theatre company and York and Yorkshire area is really rich in heritage. And it would mean giving talks on anything from railway history to the history of chocolate. York is a huge chocolate base historically. And so that really, for me, was really exciting, the way that you can reach, say, a family audience or children. I work mostly with adults now, and I found increasingly to wear clothes from the era or replicas from the era help get across a sense of well, what was it like to, to wear these things, to move in these things. It was an evolution, really. And then 22 years ago, 
I, I've just totted up how long ago it was, I established a company called History Wardrobe. And the idea of that was to present these delightful costume in context presentations. So for example, we did have a talk called Undressing Mr. Darcy. And he did undress, but it was all very educational and just talking about what it meant to be a gentleman in the Regency era. And since then we've done 60, six zero different presentation and we're always evolving, you know, things that excite and interest us. And we can take these on tour and, and share this, this fabulous collection. Does your undressing address the differences between wealthy people and poor people? how different their wardrobes would be? Very much so. And, th and that's something a lot of people working either in heritage and museums or with private collections were aware of survivor bias, that it's often elite garments that survive. And it might be special occasion clothes, like you know, things associated with a wedding, say. And we now, we do almost 100% male, uh, what am I saying? 100% <laughs> women's clothes, <laughs> because we think that it's such, um, it's such a rich source of information about women's lives that aren't documented so well. And we're always on the lookout for working women's clothes, uh, women of lower classes, and we've got some extraordinary pieces. And you realize, you know, whether you're, um, a herring girl in Whitby on the on the east coast of, of Yorkshire or a mill worker in Lancashire in England. We've got garments to represent that and just to look at how ordinary people navigated their lives and their works and the clothes can show us that. I have an interest in color and as I've applied it to textile history, I realized that color also did a big divide, like the more bright and beautiful the colors, probably the more wealthy you were. I would say there's a, yeah, there's a lot of interesting work done into elite colorings. You know, who can afford purples is an obvious one. But saying that, one thing that um, I think there's a lot of exciting new research and writing is about the past wasn't dull. I mean, even, you mentioned the Middle Ages, you know, even in the Middle Ages, people are using dyes in a really innovative ways to enliven their clothes and a color such as red, I mean, red is a great color, whatever class you are. And I would say that it's, it's in England, at least, and in parts of Europe, it's very much associated with working class women to have a red cloak or a red petticoat. Another thing that interested me in coming back to quilting is that I um, obtained a batch of 1,471 fabric samples. I know because I end each one individually. And they go from early 19th century to late 19th century. And you see how color comes into people's lives through cotton printing. And so now working people, working class people and middling sorts, they can have these cottons that are just have these wild prints on. And some of the garments I have, you know, they are almost psychedelic. And I'm talking 1820s, 1830s. I think working people have always aspired to have more pizzazz than they were supposed to. I never have thought about that before. With the printing of cotton, color could come into people's lives in a different way. That, like We talk about the abundance of, uh, or the, the affordability of cotton. That's where quilting came from. Suddenly there was pieces that had to be dealt with. But I never really thought about it from that color point of view. That could be another reason why people were so attracted to quilting. Yeah, and with mass production, the Industrial Revolution in Britain, which obviously impacts worldwide and then draws on many other different technologies and culture, the colour combinations, the pattern combinations. And this isn't I'm, just because my, my uh, pieces that I'm talking about now are 19th century. This goes back into the 18th century. And you have a lot of um, writing saying, well, we don't think we don't think that people should be able to afford these nice printed calicos. And the government enacting laws to, to try and squash it. But you can't squash flair and you can't squash that love of color and even things like the um, neck cloths neck cloths and neckerchiefs and stockings were a way for anybody of any class to get that splash of color and then as you say it trickles down into the rag bag and it's turned into quilts and then you get another flip say um, particularly in North America the feed sack the idea that you would print, and particularly during the Depression years, you would print feed sack cottons and jutes in these wonderful bright colours uh, as a way of encouraging people to buy the product. But you can have fab clothes, and there's something about colour that uplifts us, isn't it? Particularly yes. in good times. 
And different people have different places that they like to live. Like some people love those beautiful mustard desaturated ver versions of color behind you and other people just want them as psychedelic as possible. Yeah, and there's a, I think there's a lot more awareness now of how, you know, neurology links, you know, it isn't just like, oh, I kind of like this color. There have long been studies into why people resonate with certain colors, why colors affect us. I'm neurodivergent and I'm really aware that some color, I can't look at them. Or some colors to me, they just send me off into a, this, this amazing world of possibility. So I open my wardrobe doors in the morning and I think, what is today's color? What do I feel like? I've actually gone down that avenue too and have found that I've eliminated as much black from my life as possible because I find it just sucks the life out of me. If I can put bright colors in front of me, my day is different. Yeah, colors, textures, all of it. And that's, that's another reason why we love quoting is because you get to play with all of those things in, on, a, on a small scale rather than it's just being your garments. I wore a lot of black as a teenager, like many people do. And I've done talks on the history of black in fashion, but I can't wear it now. As I get older, like you say, it's not my forte. So how big is your vintage clothing collection? You know, it's really big. I've never done an inventory, but thousands of pieces. And although... We do have, you know, I say we, History Wardrobe is my company, although I do have, you know, I have some Dior, I have some Chanel, that doesn't excite me as much. Well, for example, some of the pieces I, I've got today while we're talking, pieces that hold stories. And so there might be some, yes, glamorous ball gowns, but for me, the really fantastic items in the collection are often things that are donated from my readers and audience members, and they share the stories with them and photographs. So although there are so many pieces, so many, you know, work from shoes and handbags and hats and fans, I think one of my favorite things, for example, would be a pair of pajamas from World War II. And they're striped cotton and they've been washed and washed and washed and washed and washed. And they were worn by a firewoman in London during the London Blitz. And so there's already a story, this woman called Winifred. But what I loved about them is that although the cotton has become very worn in places, she wore them until the 1970s. And then she gave them to her daughter to continue wearing because they weren't going to waste these pajamas. And they patched them with a tea towel, uh, a children's show that was really popular in England at the time called The Magic Roundabout, this strange hippie children's cartoon. And so you have this firewoman's pajamas with the tea towel. And I love how that shows women's ingenuity, their thrift, a bit of sense of humor. They must have been handmade as well. The pajamas were not handmade, actually. No, they no. were part of a government scheme in Britain, which we called the utility scheme, um, CC41, which was all about regulating factory space and labor and resources and so on. I think there was something similar in the US, but I'm not sure how Canada limited their garments during World War II. But yes, they were, they were shop bought and they, they'd still lasted. But I do also have homemade garments from the war years, including ones made out of parachute silk, still with the cords and the seamings on, you know, making, making a bit of flair from having to wear a parachute to bed. My great aunt got married in a parachute silk wedding dress. Did she? What year was that? It was after the war, but she was an officer in the war and she trained men in their fitness before they shipped over and one um paratrooper thought that the skills that she taught him saved his life and gave her his parachute brilliant brilliant i think there were a lot at the end of the war particularly silk ones as they were replaced with nylon so they have a nylon wedding dress made out of a parachute i think they were highly coveted and there are plenty of stories in britain of uh, women saying, you know, they had a, a German plane was shot down, the, the, you know, the crew bailed out. And the first thing you do isn't call the police. You grab his parachute and you stuff it away. I think that was a lovely gift. And how marvelous that she was able to help him and many others, presumably. Well, when you see the movie A Bridge Too Far and they have that scene where the thousands of paratroopers are dropping out of the sky, you think of how many yards of silk were needed yeah. and how many women were sent to work making those like it's just a mind again another mind-boggling number it's something i've enjoyed writing about um in my book 
women's lives and clothes in World War II, I actually was looking at how women not only stitched and packed parachutes, but they sewed aeroplanes. And I've been lucky enough, uh, a friend's grandmother was one of these seamstresses who was literally stitching onto the airframes of bomber and fighter planes. And I've got her work notebook and it teaches you how to darn a Wellington bomber. I just said, that's extraordinary. They used to get a little bit high on all the doping. They'd have to open the doors. And uh, so, yeah, the, the background work of women's stitching in history enables so many things to happen, doesn't it? Well, just even while we're talking, my brain has gone off in 25 different directions from clothes to the samples to the, the rags and the, the stories behind them. How do you keep yourself focused uh, and not go down these? Or do you go down all these different avenues? I go down all the different avenues. I think, because, again, I, maybe this is a brain feature that once I get into a topic, I just find it utterly irresistible to find out more, you know, that the rabbit holes. And yes, I do set myself deadlines. And yes, I'll say, right, I'm currently inventing a new talk on, as it happens, Regency, Regency Leisure. And so that's going to be my focus until I get it going. Next week, I'm doing a talk on Art Deco dressmaking. It can get a little bit infinite. So I do have some downtime. We've just got two new kittens on the farm. So I go out and play with the kittens and then I come back. And But yeah, it is all interesting. And isn't that exciting? Isn't it great that we can still be curious all the time and learning all the time? Well, there's definitely an emptiness there that we're desperately trying to fill in women's history and domestic history and uh, women's industry. Yeah, and there's been a lot of work to sort of groundwork laid down by really, really excellent makers and writers and so on. And it struck me over the two plus decades that I've been working in dress history now in academia, the new generations of researchers, but also people working in public history, public engagement, that they're bringing these histories to a wide audience through podcasts like yours and through really accessible books through public lectures you know zoom talks all of this and the amount of knowledge that's there is fantastic i think we still have a way to go in how much it's respected i still occasionally get people saying well it's just clothes isn't it i'm like come on you're not naked you know nobody fought uh, you mentioned the bridge too far there was nobody fighting through the market gardens and the, the woods and the fields and the roads of europe occupied europe naked they all had to have kit and clothes. And the way people respond in wartime for morale purposes, the way that the government policies are organized to ensure that the civilians have an adequate supply of text. I could go on and I will, but I really think we, yeah, we need more respect for the way women's stories are told. They're not necessarily stories of mass global achievements. I mean, there are, there are plenty of women who work in, in whether they're working in STEM or the arts or in domestic labor, they do brilliant things. But I think we need more respect for the everyday, for the ordinary, and particularly for unpaid labor. You spoke with the BBC on the history of women's underwear, the evolution of women's underwear. And I think that is both titillating and such a, um, a subject that just grounds all of us. As you say, we're not walking around naked how that has evolved through the years. Like what did people wear as underwear 200 years ago? Well, I can tell you, but how long have you got? <laughs> the earliest garment in my collection is a shift or a chemise or sometimes called a shimmy from the year 1800. And that's your basic body linen for women. And the equivalent for men is a shirt. And then the idea of wearing drawers comes a lot later. You know, the idea that it's considered rather unhygienic for women to wear, to wear drawers or panties, as you might refer to them, or pants. I think with underwear, I never think of it as titillating because I've worn all these underwear elements in history. And I just find them incredibly bulky, incredibly sweat making. You know, wearing corsetry from different eras, of course, you wear things that are designed to fit you and support you. So I'm not tight lacing or anything extreme, but... 
I'm even glad, actually. I'm even glad of the modern song. I don't care if it goes up my bum. It's just infinitely preferable to the layerings of historical underwear. You know, any item of clothing tells us so much about the culture, about society, about individuals. It's all infinitely interesting. So when did you first come across the story of the dressmakers of Auschwitz? So I think I first saw mention of it back in 2008. And before that, I'd long been reading into Holocaust history. I mentioned that I looked at fragments as an undergraduate. Well, these were fragments of writings and scraps of paper and tiny little mementos that of people's lives from the Holocaust. And they might have been written with fingernails or ink or pencil or whatever. It could have been paper. It could have been a name on a garment. I was very widely read in the context of the Holocaust in terms of history, but I came across mention of a fashion salon in Auschwitz. And like any normal person, I did a double take. You know, I knew that there were sewing factories. I knew that there were industrial textile factories that were operated by the Nazis using enslaved labor. I knew about ghetto workshops. I knew all of that, but a fashion salon? And I wanted to find out more, but at the time it seemed almost impossible to trace any information about the women. And so I wrote a novel, I, I love writing fiction, history inspired fiction. I wrote a novel for young adults called The Red Ribbon. And I imagined, well, what would it be like to sew for your life? As a 14 year old girl, I, I wrote it in an, an unnamed place. You know, the idea was the reader would just start from page one, what's going on? Why is she having the sewing audition? Why are the stakes so high? And I, in a way I wanted to, Put it to a reader that sewing can be life-saving and in, in this case it literally was anyway so the red ribbon was published it's been published in many different languages and it had a great response i'm pleased to say and it was read by people in israel who said well actually we know the real dressmakers of this salon it was my mother or my aunt or my grandmother and from there, there was an incredible ripple of connections around the world of survivors' families. And they were, they were incredibly generous with their time and with resources in as much as sharing photographs and memoirs and videos. It, it was an extraordinary period of research for me, very emotional. And I was able to go and visit the last surviving dressmaker of this fashion salon in Auschwitz and interview her at her home in San Francisco, then you really get the stories. More than a, a letter or a video can tell you. From that, I wrote the book, The Dressmakers of Auschwitz, a historical, you know, it's, it's nonfiction, just to set these women in center state and say, okay, who were they? We know they were Jewish, most of them from Slovakia. What was it like for them? Why did they survive? I have been blown away by what I uncovered. So to share it, to write about it. And now this, this book is, I think it's up to 22 languages, 22 translations. It's amazing. And people are interested in women's history. They're interested in the story of these, you know, they would have been ordinary women. They were makers, some of them. Some of them were absolutely skilled cutters and seamstresses, but ultimately they were young women who were, incarcerated in Auschwitz-Birkenau for being Jewish and they survived in this fashion salon making clothes for elite SS women and what does that tell you about the Nazi mindset it it's extraordinary well it's interesting how people can bend their rules to accommodate what they need we can't have Jews in the country but oh let's have Jews making our clothes one of the most staggering things I uncovered was that there was an order book in this in this fashion salon in Auschwitz, a big black order book, apparently, which has not yet been found, possibly destroyed when the, the Nazis evacuated the camp in January 1945. But in this order book, one of the seamstresses, her name was Hunya, she said it had the names of the very highest people in Berlin. So we can speculate, you know, who were these women in Berlin? elite women, was it Magda Goebbels, was it Emmy Goering? And they were ordering garments from the very Jews that the regime is set to eradicate. And there was a six month waiting list for these women because the SS families stationed at Auschwitz wanted the garments first. It's just staggering hypocrisy. And 
it certainly made me, it gave me a whole new wider perspective on, on the Third Reich and how much greed, greed and vanity were motivators, not only for individual actions, for example, setting up a fashion salon or ordering fashionable clothes, but even invasion. Why invade so much to plunder, to steal, to gain assets? And when you realize that that's one of the drivers about it, it, I think it really helps you understand so much more about the economics and politics of the Third Reich. So there we have clothing, clothing history is able to engage readers and give us new perspectives. Brilliant. Have yeah. you read the book, The Light of Days? Judy Battalion. She's an amazing author. She, in fact, she's the same publisher that I have in the US. Wonderful. Wonderful. That was yeah. also another part of women's history. Like you had no idea that there were these Jewish resistance fighters. I mean, I, yeah, you say that to me. Of course, of course they were because I, I spent my life immersed in it. But yeah, I think there's, there's always so much more to know. And when I find out that the, the Jewish woman in charge of the fashion salon in Auschwitz, the, the prisoner called Marta, when I found out she was in the underground and that she was engineering an escape to tell the world about the atrocities, and I think, why hadn't there been a book written about her? There are lots of books about other escapees who are men. And I'm so pleased that Judy Battalion wrote that book. It was a great book. And I'm happy to say that the project I'm working on at the moment does, it concerns garments again, Holocaust history, but it also features an extraordinary uprising and the women who took advantage, Jewish prisoners who took advantage of this uprising to escape and fight with partisans. So yeah, very much in that in that theme. So did they put labels inside these dresses? The dresses made in the fashion salon in Auschwitz did not have labels. And we know that lots of clothes were made in ghettos where Jewish people were corralled and, and had to do forced labor for Germans. And we know those garments were sent back to Germany and sold not as things made by Jews, but in the Auschwitz fashion salon, there, there's no way they were going to put made in Auschwitz, made in an extermination camp. They didn't want to concede that it had been made by Jewish hands. And if I can talk about, I've got some, some dresses on display while we're talking now from my collection. And I've got this really pretty, um, it's from 1939. It's a really pretty spring summer dress in apple green satin crepe and it's covered in flowers sort of peachy blue white flowers with a little frill on and this does have a label but this is not from Auschwitz this label is one of the Nazi organizations ADEFA it's essentially a federation of Aryan as they call themselves non-Jewish businessmen in the textile industry who set out in 1933 to eliminate Jews from the fashion trade, the textile trade. And they crafted garments and advertised them saying, no Jews have touched these clothes. So this is one of those dresses, just saturated with anti-Semitism. And the flip side of that is beautiful gowns made in Auschwitz in the fashion salon for the SS that would not have a, a label in. And I asked when I went to speak to the last surviving dressmaker, her name is Bracha Kohut, and I said, you know, could you mark the clothes in any way or, or did you sabotage? And she said, absolutely not. Their lives depended on creating perfect garments. And I do write a bit about that in the book. But she said the other reason they didn't was for that set of standards and personal pride. And Marta, who was the head of the workshop, even though she was, she was a Jewish prisoner, she was dedicating her time there to helping as many people as possible, gathering them into this, this haven of relative security in Auschwitz-Birkenau. She said that they had to make garments of the highest quality for themselves, for their own integrity. So there were no markings, there were no notes slipped in. Besides which, who would they be sending a message to? You know, the, the SS didn't want to hear it. The SS ordering these clothes and being measured for them and fitted for them in the salon, they didn't see the prisoners as human. How could anybody else? So we don't even know if there are any of these garments extant. We don't know if any survived. And I asked, um, the commandant of Auschwitz was Rudolf Huss and it was his wife, Hedwig, who established the fashion salon. And I asked one of Hedwig's grandsons, you know, did she keep anything from this era? And he said she didn't keep any. 
any fashions. You know, in later photographs from the family album, she's wearing modern, up-to-date fashions in the 60s and 70s and so on. So, yeah, we, we don't even know where these clothes are, but somewhere there could be clothes stitched in Auschwitz by these amazing Jewish women with the story. We don't know. Can you tell me the story? Is that a suit behind you? I'm just looking at the wonderful yeah. patterns, like you could wear that today. Yes, you could. And I have let people occasionally try on the jacket. So I'm, I'm talking about what survives and what doesn't. And this garment, um, it's actually, it's a jacket, a really smart, boxy jacket and a fabulous pleated skirt. The pleats are one of the, like the stay pressed pleats, you know, it's a really crisp and it's in an amazing geometric pattern of um, mid browns, ivory and black. It's from the 1950s and it's from Israel. And this, I brought it today to talk about because this does have a story. It doesn't have a label, but it was made by Hunya. Hunya was one of the Jewish dressmakers in the salon at Auschwitz. She survived thanks to her work, thanks to her skills and to the camaraderie of everybody in this workshop who helped each other. And after the war, being very thrifty in Israel, a lot of austerity, a lot of thrift in the 1950s, she turned one of her dresses into a suit for her niece, Gila. And her Gila was, I think, about 15. And so this is Hunya's work, crafting something old, new from old. And as Hunya was stitching this, Gila wrote down the stories that Hunya told. So that connection between textiles, women's work, storytelling. And these form parts of uh, a memoir in Hebrew, which Gila shared with me, and which I in turn have shared elements in the book. So I love this suit. I think this is probably the most precious thing in my collection. It made me very emotional when, when Gila gifted it to me. So you talk about a collection. Do you wear your collection or do you keep it archived? I, saw, I do wear some sturdy vintage pieces you know everyday blazers and things like that my figure isn't <laughs> I've hit my 50s and had a lot of cake so a lot of the garments in the collection are either too small or too fragile so I don't tend to I won't wear anything regency you know that's for display but it's surprising what can still be worn and so when I'm giving presentations with history wardrobe we do wear originals where possible and they're usually garments that have already been marked or stained or ripped you know they're not museum quality and it's something else, you know, to put these clothes on and to think, well, who made this? Who last wore it? How did it come to me? So in real life, I'm not at all fashionable, not at all. But on stage, yeah, I love, I love to wear, to wear vintage. And mostly the, the garments of my collection is, it is archived. But at the moment, there's a, an exhibition running in Yorkshire on my collection or highlights from the collection you know it, it almost seemed to barely make a dent just looking at at this whole collection and some of the stories of the clothes in it and that's been really special to see people coming to this this it's a gorgeous exhibition this whole fashion gallery transformed with colors and and fabulous textiles and just watching people go around the museum and saying oh I had one of those or my nan made one of those that's been a really nice way to share the collection. I went to a fashion show at our uh, the big museum downtown, maybe about 10 years ago. And my partner, I didn't realize, knew, in, had encyclopedic knowledge of fashion of the 60s. She knew it year by year, but how many people reacted, just like you're saying, oh, my mother had one of those. Oh, I remember that picture of my grandmother wearing something like that. It's interesting how, in a second, you can be transported with, with yeah. cloth. Cloth and music and perfume and all of those things together. It's very multi-sensory. But yeah, there's definitely and we let people handle the garments when we take them to presentations. I think it's really important where possible. Obviously, not with fragile ones, we have to be be more considerate. But you know, women in particular, we can't resist touching fabrics and getting the feel of it and the quality of it. But I think the 1960s is a fab era to present on and for the longest time I said I'm not going to do the 60s I don't look like Twiggy anymore and it's you know it's all about youth surely in the 60s and then you think well of course it wasn't because there are people of all ages so we got round this by starting a presentation called the frock shop 
and we imagined that we were two elegant ladies, you know, Madame, running an elegant boutique at the start of the 60s, but being hit by all these incredible modern vibes and innovations. And so we end up, you know, full of Mary Quant, a bit of Zandra Rhodes, you know, some really hippie, trippy, psychedelic stuff to, to span that, what a vibrant decade. So yeah, I think with history, we can get the nostalgia element, as in I remember that, or my mom had that. I suppose it's the further back you go, the more it's like, oh, wasn't that strange? Weren't people funny in those days or elegant in those days? And there's a bit more distance. But I think it's really important for us, whatever decade we're looking at, you know, say you're looking at Art Deco in the 20s, don't think, no, that was a different, you know, these people were different then. They weren't. They were us in different times, different places, different clothes. Uh, and so, yeah, breaking it down and just saying, what would I have worn then? How would I have managed? And girdles, actually, is the simple answer to that. So have you passed on your love of textiles to your family? I, I, I don't know. They, um, my family think I'm weird and wonderful. That's probably a, a, good, a good summary. But I think the love of textiles is infectious. And so I would say the history wardrobe is like a family now. We have fans, especially in the UK, but around the world. And we share stories and they share, you know, garments, we share photographs. It's an incredible community. So I would say that's my, that's my, uh, my vintage clothing family. So tell me about your tea cozy there. So I thought since we're, um, we're maybe speaking to lots of quilt lovers, I do have some really nice um, quilted items in the collection. And I do quilting myself piecing, just very basic uh, quilting. I'm not a great sewer. And I, but I love using oddments of fabric left over from costume, you know, left over from projects. And I was just holidaying in the north of England, a very beautiful part of the world called Northumberland. And the place I was staying at, a very peculiar lodge full of brilliant artistry and quirks, they were selling off some antique items. So I bought this very robust quilted teapot cozy, tea cozy, I do like my tea and it's done in the style of crazy quilting which you will you will be able to see with lots of scraps we've got watered taffeta we've got velvet we've got shot silk some brocade and then a little bit of um little stitching and a nice bit of gold braid I have not yet used it because I want to check it doesn't have moths first so it's been in the freezer that's what I do I don't do you do that do you freeze I now do it I was at the Textile Research Institute in Leiden last year. I interviewed the executive director of the International Quilt Museum, and both of them told me you should always put your vintage stuff in the freezer for at least two weeks before you take them out. Yeah, and I, I mean, best one in the world, moths are not our, house moths, you know, clothes moths are not our friend. I think with home freezing, I'm, Sometimes I'm skeptical, does it really get cold enough? So one extra tip I would say okay. is yes, put it in for two weeks. Obviously you wrap it so that the water doesn't get into it. Then take it out. If you can put it outside, Let if there's any larvae that have managed to survive the temperature, they wake up and they start stretching in the sun and then you put it back in the freezer and that may work. I do also press items, you know, with a hot iron and a cloth. Uh, some things I do put through the washing machine and I use cedar wood, I use lavender and frankly I use rent kill chemicals although other products are available because I can't bear the idea of adding to any depredation in things I own but inevitably you can't preserve things perfectly and would we love them more if they were perfect? I don't know. I still I like the, the things with quirks and flaws. I was listening to a podcast about somebody preserving Martha Washington's corset and talking about how stained and what the sweat of off her body and things like that. And that's just, nobody washes it to take that out. That's just part of the history of the garment. Yeah, I think that there's a very important distinction between um, reconstructing something 
and preserving it or conserving it. And I would say with Martha Washington's garment, it's really important to stabilize it. You've got to keep it so it doesn't degrade further. And that's the same with NASA spacesuits from the Apollo missions. There's some extraordinary skill, you know, the science behind them working out how to preserve these garments from the late 1960s. And I'm currently working on a new book now, which is looking at how garments from the Holocaust are preserved. So with items, for example, that are part of the Auschwitz-Birkenau State Museum, they don't want to restore them to how they looked perfectly. That would almost be insulting, wouldn't it, to say, oh, we can just unwind time and make this little leather shoe perfect again. Part of the poignancy of it is this shoe will hold the imprint of the wearer. It'll show where their bunions went or which, you know, which part of the sole that they wore down on. And it, the decay over time is also part of the, the passage of time, and I just think it's so it's so powerful that people have the skills to to conserve, to preserve, so that we can see them. They can be held for future generations and continue telling their stories without whitewashing, without pretend, pretending that everything in the past was a lovely costume drama, that everybody was always immaculate and did not spill a cup of tea down their corset or sweat on it. We have to see that things were patched and mended so that we can appreciate that textiles they were valuable in the past. You didn't just chuck them. You didn't just go on to an online retailer and have a big haul that you took care of what you had, even if you're Martha Washington. So tell me about your lectures. Uh, I lecture in person. I give presentations and they are presentations. This is not PowerPoint. We take a huge display of fantastic fashions, whatever topic we're discussing. So tomorrow I'm giving a talk on the history of laundry. And we are taking all the implements. We are going to do laundry on stage. Um, so we always have a great display of items. And we love to use stories, real stories, and share memories and so on. And so I tour the UK with those. But we also do uh, as much work as we can on Zoom because it's a brilliant way to, to reach international audiences. I would love to have the time to do more videos. I'd love to, to have a YouTube channel with more videos. I've got a few because there's always, always things to talk about. So yeah, History Wardrobe have a very vibrant events calendar and it's, it's never dull. So if people want to get a hold of you, what's the best way to reach you? I would say Google Lucy Adlington or History Wardrobe and both my websites have a contact form. I am on socials, but I sort of... Uh, <laughs> it's always the last thing to get done, isn't it? Posting and updating. I'm too busy unboxing exciting new acquisitions. Um, so they, they will be very welcome to contact me uh, through my websites. I do love hearing from people. And always nice to, when people have inquiries about dating photographs or, you know, looking after the, their family heirlooms, sharing stories, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for being on the show. I've really enjoyed talking to you. I'm sure I could have talked to you for at least another hour, but I appreciate well, I would love to interview you. I think that would be incredibly fascinating. It's all very one-sided now, but I think the, the projects you're involved in sound great. And I think I'm not surprised you have such a loyal fan base and listener base. So it's been a real pleasure to chat today. I hope you've enjoyed my interview with Lucy Adlington. There are so many heroes of World War II whose stories have never been told. I am very glad that this one was. If you would like your own copy of The Dressmakers of Auschwitz, I'll leave a link in the video notes below. I'll also leave links to Lucy's website and her social media as well. Next time you're in your sewing room, be sure to have Karen's Quilt Circle playing in the background. I have interviewed so many amazing people on this show. Let one inspire you. Take care, and I'll see you next time.